my name is Ray Dorsey. I'm a neurologist and the director for the Center for Health and Technology. Today, we're taking an inside look at telemedicine during the pandemic, and we couldn't have a better guess. Dr. Cynthia Horner is a medical director at Amwell, one of the country's largest telemedicine companies. She's a family practitioner who completed her undergraduate studies at Duke University and her medical school and, train, and medical training at Virginia Commonwealth University. She's practiced medicine for over the last 20 years, been at Amwell for the last four, and is medical director for the last two. Uh, Cynthia, welcome to Chet Talks. Thanks so much, Ray. Happy to so be here. I understand here. that uh, 30 minutes ago, you were seeing somebody via telemedicine. Can you tell us a little bit about that visit? Yeah, I sure can. Actually, um, it's really timely because um, it was a case of COVID toes. Um, uh, a 14-year-old uh, young man um, who had no other symptoms, uh, came in, uh, really didn't have any respiratory symptoms, any, um, any GI symptoms, any other symptoms of vasculitis. You know, you do the whole screening for uh, other, other possible vasculitides. And, uh, but what he did have was four days of little tender red spots um, on his toes and some burning and tingling in his toes. And, um, no other risk factors. Um, and when you looked at him, he had some uh, one palpable purpura and a few small petechiae, but otherwise no other signs of vasculitis, no swelling, no, no other issues. Um, and the irony is I've seen in the last week, four cases of this. And, you know, I see a lot of folks on telehealth, but um, I could probably count on one hand the number of vasculitis cases that come, come to us through a video visit. Uh, in a year. So three cases, four cases in the last week, <laughs> pretty impressive. So I don't know if you've seen in the news reports, um, this, this situation called COVID toes or this condition called COVID toes. Um, it's brand new out there. I think the New York Times has posted some information uh, that we're getting out of the neurologic community. Um, they think it's a combination of a neuropathy and a vasculitis or a small vessel vasculitis seems to be affecting um, predominantly otherwise healthy young um, individuals, particularly kids and young adults, um, and people who oftentimes don't present with any other symptoms. Um, now I'm presuming in this young man that it's, that it's coronavirus related because he had no other issues, um, no, no other reasons, frankly. Um, but yeah, so um, if, you, if you look on your um, active medical uh, uh, search sites, you'll start to see COVID toes as a, as a diagnosis that's coming up. It's brand new out there. We like to be real time. And so we're gonna to go to see COVID toes uh, right now. New information from Dr. Horner. And you wanna describe it a little bit more since you're the doctor? Yeah, so what's interesting, um, if you look at the, the picture that you just pulled up, that's the far right hand uh, picture, that's actually, um, typical, not of the 14 year old that I saw, but um, uh, actually the one directly to the left of that, the three days ago, red swollen toes, that looked more like that one actually was more like the, the 14 year old that I saw. But the, um, but the one now on the far left, um, I saw a case of literally uh, last night, actually. And what we're seeing, that one exactly, what we're seeing with these is typically on the distal um, ends of the toes, um, uh, as I said, palpable purpura um, that are not associated with any kind of hematuria. You know, we're not worried about peanut shunline purpura or any other kinds of causes of vasculitis. No respiratory symptoms in these kids uh, or young adults particularly, um, but they're tender. And um, uh, the, the cases that I've seen, there haven't been any other cases. When you look at the case reports that are coming out that we're starting to see reports of, um, uh, typically they are being found in patients with no other symptoms or they might start developing some very mild respiratory symptoms a couple of days after they get this uh, what's presumed to be vasculitis and it tends to run it's a really mild course it tends to resolve within a couple of within typically about 10 days um, and they're otherwise often asymptomatic so hot off the presses <laughs> so did you recommend uh, testing did you recommend any intervention so great question. Um, that's a Pandora's box when we talk about testing. The short answer is I did, but I also gave the family, the mom in particular, you know, a caveat that 
it probably in this young man's case is not going to affect the recommendations for his care because he is in a low risk group. Um, he otherwise had no other medical conditions and he nor any of his household members are either critical infrastructure workers or had other medical risk factors. So essentially, I said, we can either treat you presumptively as if this is coronavirus. And then in that case, I'm going to have you be super careful. Um, I'm going to call this a symptom of coronavirus, even though, make an argument, um, uh, that um, his toes aren't going to be shedding virus. <laughs> so typically the shedding of the virus is a respiratory uh, 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 matter, manner of spread. But, um, but out of an abundance of caution, I said, I want you to basically self-isolate for seven days and until, um, assuming that you don't develop any other symptoms, until you are improved and the rash is going down for, for three days in addition to that minimum of seven days. If we test you, um, here's how we go about doing this. I'll write you the paperwork through our telehealth platform. Um, um, and here's where you can find out where you get tested. So. And uh, is, there, is testing available just in general when you're recommending testing? Is testing available uh, for such individuals, just generalizing it beyond just this one case? Pocket. Um, it really depends on the community. So I pretty much am giving people um, the caveat that um, while we can refer you for testing, here's what you want. We, we tell people if, if you can get testing and you're positive, here's what you do. If you can't get testing, we're going to presume that you're positive. So please follow the same advice. If you, the benefit in most cases, not all, but um, most cases to getting testing is to prove that they're negative because then the restrictions for isolation are a little bit shorter. Um, so testing is really still sporadic, but despite what I'm hearing, um, you know, in news reports, there are some places where you can easily get testing. Some of the larger communities, particularly in New York um, uh, and New Jersey, we're starting to find a lot of uh, good access to testing, but, um, but that is not the case across the country. I can definitely tell you that. So um, there are places where that we help people figure out where can they get tested in their community. There's some, you know, Google even can, get, can you can search um, testing in my zip code. And um, they tend to have actually a fairly now in the last week, uh, robust search engine for that. But there's other search engines. And when we're working, okay. you know, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, we have, we work with at Amwell, um, you know, frankly, 55 different health plans. We have 240 health systems that we work with and uh, over 2,000 hospitals. So I should give the caveat that when we're working, when we're seeing patients within those particular hospital systems or, uh, you know, um, that, you know, with specific uh, clients that we have, some of our clients actually, and some of our hospital systems have internal protocols that we follow that we say, um, okay, because you're with this particular um, hospital system, here's how we're gonna go about getting you tested. So it's not quite uh, the same as say, a, you know, a direct to, direct to consumer uh, visit. Um, for this 14 uh, year old or just in general, how does, how did he find you? Is this through his, uh, uh, he's obviously not employed, is this through his insurer? Did his mom have this as a benefit? How have they come to find Amla? Great question. This particular um, patient came to us through um, a health system that they, their primary care doctor works with. And so basically they were um, alerted through their primary care doc that because the doctor's office was closed, they could seek telehealth care um, through the health system. And um, so they actually came in through uh, what we call our white label program, which is basically this particular health system. Um, it's branded as that particular health system. They come in and um, our group, um, they, they have doctors of their own that are employed by the health system that see patients, but when those doctors aren't available, our group backfills for them. This could be Unity Health System there. They get all their care through Unity Health System. Their PCP is not available, and then they saw you as a backup uh, option. Yeah, exactly. And to, to the patient, I, they're blinded to the fact that I'm not, you know, living in their community. Um, so, you know, we don't hide it, but, um, but to, from the patient's perspective, it's all one and the same. So where are you right now? Uh, actually, currently I am um, physically right now in Virginia. Um, I work out of both Boston and uh, Northern Virginia. 
Um, and then, so where do most of uh, AMWELLs that patients come from? Really across the country. Um, and we are in 50 different states. Um, and um, the biggest, earliest adopters uh, from a regional standpoint for, from telehealth have been some of your, you know, not surprising states. It's going to be California, um, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts is a big state, but frankly, a lot of your southeastern states as well. Um, um, Virginia, uh, Florida, um, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina tend to be fairly, fairly busy states. Pennsylvania, Texas is also a big state for us now, although they were, they came a little bit later regulatory wise to the, to the party, so to speak. Um, but very quickly, um, between the health systems and the, you know, the direct patients, um, they've been quick adopters. And are most of them coming in because their health systems contract with AMWELL or are they doing direct to consumer and they just finding AMWELL because they do a Google search? Is it because they have insurance through Blue Cross and Blue Cross has contracted with AMWELL to provide this service? Can you tell us a little bit about how it goes? Yeah, the all of the above, actually. Um, I would say when you look at where the bulk of the patients come through, um, just because we are so tightly uh, connected with, you know, our health system partners and our health plans, over 55 health plans, you know, um, uh, that, with whom we work, um, I would say a large percentage of our patients come in through there, but we also get a very large percentage of patients that come through from direct-to-consumer where they're just, you know, they Google, tell us, uh, telehealth um, or see a doctor online and you know we pop up um, um, but but one of the differentiators with amwell is that we are not just urgent care you know one-off visits we really do work very closely with uh, health systems and health plans either um, to help provide urgent care services but also to do programmatic work you know we've had a number of different programs with some of our clients that uh, where we will do um, wellness screenings for them, smoking cessation, behavioral health. Um, we've got in-hospital programs that, that utilize a cart to allow specialists, say for example, you know, here in Virginia, um, specialists who might be located in an urban area, the, the hospital has a rural site, but they don't really have the cardiologist or the uh, neurologist at that site, well, we've got a cart where the doctor can actually walk into the hospital room and do a clinical visit with an MA. Um, so it's it's got all the peripherals to to do the exam. So it's it's in that case, it's the equivalent of a um, uh, robotic surgery, if you will. <laughs> so, um, but yes, to to circle back to your original question, it's it's both, but I would probably say more through the health systems and hospitals and health plans. Um. We're going to get let to get questions up from people that are going to ask you about licensure. I see other questions will likely come up. We'll get to them in a, in a moment. If people have questions, please put them in. We're going to uh, take up many of your questions uh, at the end. Um, so we've talked about where the patient comes from. They presumably get queued in. They probably go to the AMWEB website. I assume they get intake information. They get queued up and then they get to see you. Right. So go ahead. So I'm happy to take that process further and explain, yeah. okay, well, how do they get to me? Um, so one of the things that they have the option of is they can scroll down and they can see the clinician before they see them and they can choose, you know, I actually want to see a woman doctor um, or um, I want to see somebody that was trained in the state where I come from. There's, you know, pe people pick their clinician for a whole host of different reasons. So they have the option to choose or they can just say, I don't really care. It's for poison ivy. I want to see the first available. <laughs> so, so they choose their clinician or choose first available. They get a little brief intro video on, okay, here's how this is going to work. Um, and then the, then from the clinician side, from my side, um, we get, um, we have an open window on our computer that basically is a waiting room. And so a patient pops into my waiting room, I click on them and then the video, just like the zoom, uh, uh, meeting, the video launches on both the patient side and my side and we start talking. Um, and I ask them, the patient does have the ability initially to put in their chief complaint. Um, our system is connected also, uh, with, um, Sure scripts, so we can actually see if the patient approve allows us to see it. We can see recent prescriptions that were written on their behalf um, that go through Sure scripts. Um, some of the health system partners um, allow, uh, you know, if they're working with their own clinicians within the health system, 
then it integrates with their, with their medical record. So they can actually see the entire medical record from the health system, just like you could if you were on Epic in your own, you know, in your own uh, office. Um, so, so we may have some of that background information to begin with, but then we just, we talk to patients, we examine them, we find out what their history is, but we also examine them via video visit, make a diagnosis, um, or if I can't get enough data, um, whether it's through just um, asking them to kind of, does it hurt when you push your shoulder here? Or can you say, ah, show me what's in, your, in the back of your throat? Um, give me a good cough. There are peripherals that we can use um, uh, that some patients have and some, some health plans actually have programs that are connected with, this, with one peripheral in particular called the TidoCare device. Um, which is actually a digital stethoscope, otoscope, um, uh, uh, um, and it, it, it's a pulse monitor as well. So that it, it extends our ability to visualize um, quite a bit, actually, particularly when we're talking about ears. I, you know, patients can put it on their chest and I can actually get a digital recording or digital live sound. Uh, actually, it's a recording of a, a asynchronous recording of what their heart rate sounds like. So that can be super helpful when patients actually have that. Um, but then we make a diagnosis and a plan and send prescriptions should they, yeah, there it is, exactly. Um, and send, uh, send a prescription directly to the pharmacy and give whatever recommended follow-up instructions would be there, so. Um, you got a lot in there. Uh, so <laughs> It sounds like you have no access to the electronic medical record. You don't know what their previous medical history is. You don't want, know what medications that they're on. Is that true? And, and if so, does that mean that you just ask them those questions? So it can sometimes be true. Um, it, um, as I said, we do have access to prescriptions that were sent. Patients will often upload that information. So it's just as if a patient comes into your office as a new visit or you're an urgent care doc and they walk in off the streets. It's, it can be similar to that where we have to rely on them to give us the information. When we're working within a health system, um, we actually get the health system information um, in, in most cases. Um, there are some cases where, um, where, where that, that access is, is firewalled, but, um, but sometimes we get it, sometimes we have to rely on the patients. But most patients, honestly, I will say, are great about sharing that information. Dr. Sam Frank asks uh, about licensure. So uh, this patient you saw probably didn't live in Virginia, probably didn't live in Boston, you don't need to identify him uh, at all. Uh, so in the past, I imagine that you have multiple licenses and that many uh, animal docs have multiple licenses. You, you can talk a little bit about that. Why don't you talk a little bit about that first, and then we'll talk about how that might have changed in the setting of the pandemic. Yeah, it has definitely changed. Um, so yes, um, um, I am licensed currently in just under 30 states. Um, so, um, so I am multi-state licensed. There are some states uh, that follow the um, FSMB, and I'm going to have to sort of scratch my head for a minute and remember what that, what specifically, it's the Federal State Medical Board. It's a reciprocity agreement among, I think it's 18 states, but don't quote me on that. Um, where if you're licensed in one of the states, the other states have agreed to allow reciprocity. Um, so um, that is growing, that is changing, even pre-COVID, um, and that, that's a permanent uh, uh, licensure agreement. So um, some of our docs actually are FSMB um, uh, licensed, and um, that process is actually quite a bit easier than having to go state by state by state for licensure. So uh, people think, you know, 30 uh, state licenses, uh, but that's actually a tremendous amount of work uh, and a tremendous amount of cost and a tremendous amount of time. Can you tell us a little bit, like each state has the requirements, some like want to make sure that you're trained in elder abuse, some in substance abuse, some in uh, child abuse, some in HIV, uh, some in elder care. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how much time and effort it is to maintain uh, all those licenses? Yeah, actually, that is, that's a really great question. Um, getting the licenses is a bit of a hassle because you, each state has their own specific nuanced requirements. Most of them are, have a lot of overlap, but the upkeep of the licensure really, frankly, um, I have to use um, a spreadsheet and there are a number of companies that are out there that actually help multi-state licensed doctors 
um, know what their requirements are and um, send them, um, you know, and, and frankly, a lot of the states will also send you uh, free CNE um, reminders and um, uh, access to free CME because each state has its own particular requirements. So some states, for example, will have controlled substances requirements, but they want you to hear theirs. Um, some states have domestic violence and abuse requirements, but it's specific to the state regulations. So you can't just take a generic domestic violence uh, CME, but for some you can. So um, that requires a degree of upfront organization. Um, it's not as simple as just going to your, you know, your specialty board and, you know, a lot of the specialty boards will actually have the list of what you need. For, that's fine, but it's not quite that simple. You really need to, to um, make sure that upfront you're keeping track of your CNE because that, that'll bite you if you don't. And the interstate compact, does that make it easier? I mean, if you're licensed in Ohio and Kentucky or California is on that, does that mean that you don't have to satisfy their particular state's requirements or you just still have to do that? You still have to do it, although there's more overlap. Um, and then you want to tell us a little bit how this has all changed in the setting of COVID? So yes, um, every week actually new states are coming online saying, uh, releasing their restrictions and allowing for reciprocity with uh, varying time limits. Um, um, some, some have been a month, some have been six weeks, some have been until further notice. Um, uh, but basically because of the paucity of, of access um, and extreme long lines in emergency rooms and urgent care uh, centers, and the recognition, I think, um, nationally and among a lot of the sort of on the ground health systems that really telehealth is a great first line screening um, uh, opportunity, both for COVID, but also for other medical conditions that we really don't need to be sending to the ER. Um, the state's medical boards have actually um, allowed reciprocity. And I think we're probably, and don't quote me again on the number, but um, it's well over a dozen. Um, at this point that are that are allowing reciprocity with other states. Say that last part again? I believe it's well over a dozen states and I can oh. pull this up while oh. we're talking um, as to who's got the reciprocity right now but um, but I believe it's at least 12 and and perhaps closer to 18 at this point. Uh, on the clinical side what proportion of your patients right now are related to COVID or are you back waiting for possible COVID? Is it 1%? Is it 10%? Oh, is it 50%? Oh. Yeah, no, I would say, had you asked me that about three or four weeks ago, I'd say about 80%, um, the vast majority, um, right when, um, when this all started kind of exploding across the country, um, I, would, I would have said the vast majority of my visits were COVID related. Just people asking questions as well as people that were worried about their symptoms, people that had allergies that weren't sure if it was COVID. Um, now it, it's kind of settled down. Um, recognize that, that my perspective does not include, that it's a little biased. So I'm going to tell you the answer, but I think there's a reason why it's dropped fairly significantly for me. But um, right now it's probably closer to about 50%, 40 to 50% of the visits are COVID, which is still a significant percentage. But what, what sits underneath that number is the fact that we have had a massive growth in health systems coming online with their own clinicians, um, seeing a lot of their own patients. Um, uh, you know, just within the last um, uh, you know couple of months, uh, this year versus our projected volume uh, of just total patient volume, um, our we call it the Amwell Medical Group, the, the, the group in which I sit that kind of backfills some of these visits and does direct to consumer, uh, sees patients on health systems when, when the health system physicians aren't there. We are up over 200% total volume compared to our projected volume for this year. Health system doctors, on the other hand, are up over 2,000%. And what, what part of that is, is a lot of these doctors are coming online for the first time and starting to see some of these patients. So they're gonna be peeling off um, a number of those COVID patients as well. Um, so it has dropped, but it's not clear to me whether it's dropped because we're because we're not. I'm not seeing them as much. Um, that some a lot of these uh, more uh, COVID folks are going to be actually going to their local local doctor online. So Amwell's a number of telemedicine business has essentially tripled over what it was expected. Uh, 
to have been uh, for this year. Does that mean that you're seeing 100,000 patients a year, a million patients a year? Can you give us a sense of like how many visits that is? Well, I actually, I, I have to tell you, I don't have those actual numbers in terms of numbers of visits per year. What I can tell you is um, in the last, hold on, let me just double check this. In, in one day um, on April 6th, we saw 35,000 patients. Um, now that was a record day for us, <laughs> I will tell you that. Um, but, um, and that's not, that's not, if you can't multiply that times 365 and say, okay, well that's their volume. Um, but we, we are seeing tens of thousands of patients a day between the health systems and, and MLA medical group. That works out to a little math, like 4 million, maybe 10 million visits a, a year. Um, just by contrast for people, there's about a billion, well, there were <laughs> about a billion uh, office visits a year in the U.S. So, you know, a, you know, not quite one, you know, thinking about 1% of all uh, visits in the country are happening through American Well, uh, you know, that's pretty remarkable. Um, so that's, how many patients do you see in a day? How long are these visits? Uh, what are your office hours? Uh, tell us a little bit. Yeah, great question. So I have the ability to write my own schedule, um, but I, I do see patients um, uh, personally 35 hours a week, actually 30 hours a week, and then the rest of my time is my medical director work. So, you know, I've, I've, I've got that other piece that I do. But um, but we do do it in shifts. I got to tell you, sitting down at a computer and seeing patient, 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 um, personally for me, more than four hours in a row, and I need to stand. I need to get up. <laughs> I need a little break. So I usually do uh, six to eight hours a day, um, but not every day. And um, so, you know, 30 hours a week, that's kind of my personal shift. We've got docs who are actually seeing, uh, doing 40 hour work weeks uh, with just clinic, clinical care. Um, and then we've got docs who do it, do it um, much more part-time than that, maybe 10 to 15 hours a week. Um, each visit typically is going to run about roughly about eight to 10 minutes, which, you know, when I came from brick and mortar, I was sort of like, oh my gosh, those are like crazy fast visits. How can they do any kind of clinical, you know, decent care? But you have to remember, these are not your hypertensive diabetics with coronary artery disease that are coming in for their peripheral neuropathy. These are, these are most of them, um, sort of on average, they're going to be your quick urgent care visits, your sinuses, your poison IVs, your conjunctivitis, your, you know, I could, I could keep listing them. So they are the faster visits um, on those 10 minute visits. Now we do have some that are a little bit longer. Um, actually some, uh, one of our clients was a workman's comp, is a workman's comp uh, client. And those always are going to be longer. We're going to take we take the time that we need to do the care that we need to. So there's no, you know, requirement. You have to keep it within a particular time frame, but, but that's the average. Uh, wow. Um, I'm sure it's going to spark as the, these insights are going to uh, uh, lead to a lot of uh, additional uh, questions. Uh, I assume you're seeing adults. You're a fan of practitioner, so I assume you mm -hmm. see adults. I assume you see kids. Uh, yeah. Can you give? Are these? people in cities? Are they hanging out in uh, Richmond, Virginia, or are they hanging out in, you know, New Hartford, New York? Uh, can you just give a sense of like- All of it. And, you know, the sort of the most rural patient that I saw was a trucker from Wyoming that literally I, I was trying to figure out how to get a prescription for him. And he said, well, the closest pharmacy is 200 miles away. <laughs> okay. So that was the most rural patient I've actually seen. It's memorable. Um, you know, I will say we are going to be, just by the nature of the connection, we are only going to be seeing patients in areas that have Wi-Fi access or cellular access. So um, if, if they're in a place where they actually can't get a, um, we strongly prefer video visit, although, you know, where states allow it, we, we do do phone only visits as well. But um, but it requires a certain bandwidth to certainly do the video visit, or you have to actually be able to have internet uh, uh, capability. So, um, um, but if but if that's that's the main metric, that kind of leaves most of the country. Um, so it's rural, urban, suburban. Um, it's not. It's interesting. The bulk of the patients. And you didn't ask this question, but 
we're finding that the bulk of our volume is Monday through Friday and then um, Saturday mornings, um, sort of during office hours and then right around dinner time. Um, <laughs> I always joke when families get together and they look at each other and say, oh, you don't look so good. <laughs> so you need to see a doctor, but the office is closed. <laughs> so. so is Amwell 24 seven and is it seven days a week? And uh, how do you staff 24 seven, seven days a week? Uh, do you have people who love the nights or how's that work? We do, actually. Um, we've got nocturnists, and um, that's actually really important because if they're going to be doing it regularly, um, it's just not good for the clinician and it's not good for the patients to try to try to alternate between days and nights. Um, you know, we're, our docs have been in practice for at least five years, so presumably they're, they're no longer like 18 or 21. <laughs> so, so, but most of them, you know, most of our docs are um, you know, within about 10 to 10 to 15, 20 years out of, out of, um, out of residency. So, um, uh, but the, the short and the long of it is in terms of staffing, um, uh, we build a, a staffing matrix and then we have a number of docs that can come in on demand. Um, so we build the, the staffing matrix to cover the key hours so that we've got people on in all 50 states. So it's a, you can imagine the complexity of this. Um, and uh, 24 seven, 365. And then, and then in addition to that, we have uh, docs that are licensed in some of our heavier volume states that are encouraged to, to come in um, during our heavier seasons, so. Um, telemedicine sounds great. There are clearly some limitations to telemedicine. I imagine you get people who have acute shortness of breath or a little chest pain or something you're not so sure is indigestion or, Maybe you just can't figure out what it is because you can't uh, figure it out. Have enough data, yeah. You don't have enough data. Can you tell us, is that 1% of your patients? Is that 10% of your patients? Is that 50%? And then uh, how do you manage that? Yeah, no, great question. Um, uh, I would probably say in terms of numbers, we don't get that many. It's surprising. And it's, and it's in part because patients self-select. I think a lot of our patients are educated that if they're having acute substernal chest pain, they can't breathe, or it looks like they're starting to have a stroke, they're probably not gonna call in for a telehealth visit. Um, so I would say probably about maybe 2% of patients are emergencies that really we need to put an all stop and work that patient through the emergency call 911. And we've got a whole protocol with which we stay with the patient on the phone. We call 911 and um, stay with them until the EMTs actually arrive. Um, and then we call ahead to the ER, et cetera. So that's, that doesn't happen very often. I'd say in my four years, I've had that three times. Um, and um, uh, the more common scenario is where patients um, will call in, um, say for a phone visit, thinking they've got strep throat and thinking that the description of the throat is plenty um, and where we need to convert them to a video visit so that I can actually see their throat, <laughs> and just like I would in a brick and mortar practice. Um, or they call in um, with, you know, a classic one would be a child with abdominal pain. Um, there's some abdominal pains that you can get a really good gestalt on and you can have the parent kind of palpate the belly. Um, but real low threshold for sending those kids in because I don't have the ability to do the same kind of exam hands-on. I would say those you really need to be seen in person. Um, I need to do additional testing. I need an x-ray, I need lab work to really understand what this is about. Um, maybe 15% 15, 15 of cases that come in. Um, so the bulk of that is, you know, um, in part because of patient self-selection. Um, and some of it is over time, we start to educate patients um, to say, you know, that really needs to be seen in person. <laughs> so. Um, uh, so you mentioned a couple things. So one, when they say, ah, are they literally going up to the camera and saying, oh, absolutely. Ah. yep, they really are, which is embarrassing for them. But I tell them, you know, honestly, I do this all day long. And you get to know some tricks and tips on how to use these really high definition cameras uh, on, on most video systems, on most computer systems um, to, to see what you need to see and how to get the proper lighting. And then the acute abdomen, as you indicate, not really well suited to being evaluated remotely. Uh, feeling of abdomen can tell you a lot. Uh, you mentioned 2% you thought were true emergencies. What percent do you think, you know, I can't figure it out, you need to go uh, see yeah, someone? That's, or, 
that was probably about that 15%, 15 to 20, oh. somewhere in that zone. Um, and some of that actually is in part because we are really particular about following the same evidence-based standard of care that um, I would use in brick and mortar practice. So can I give a woman who calls in with a recurrent urinary tract infection two weeks after she just finished some antibiotics for her last urinary tract infection, could I send a prescription over? Technologically, sure. Is that the standard of care? Absolutely not. So that woman, our, our protocol is to say, you know, you really need to be sent, seen in person. We don't treat STIs online for the same reason. Um, there's a whole issue of, yeah, if it's a HIPAA compliant video, but we're not going to be examining your private area online just because there's a perception of um, voyeurism and, and I can't get a chaperone in my room. <laughs> it would, um, kind of a little awkward with that, um, but um, and I can't trust a patient's chaperone uh, as being an advocate. So there's a, the medical legal issue on that. But also we can't, you know, we're not going to be doing state health department reporting and follow up and lab testing. And I can't give injectable medications that are appropriate for some of the STIs. So, um, so. I don't know where I was going with that, but yeah. <laughs> so you said 15%, 20%, so sexually transmitted infections, uh, actually a big use for teledermatology, uh, my understanding is sexually transmitted uh, diseases, but uh, obviously not appropriate for live uh, video uh, visits. It's worth noting that in the academic literature, uh, numerous studies have looked at this, and about 80% of diagnoses are based on history, about 10% on physical exam, and about 10% uh, on uh, diagnostic testing, a CBC or an X-ray. Yeah. Sounds like that's pretty much what your experience uh, is. Um, yeah. You're getting a lot of people who've never done telemedicine before. Uh, tell us, can you tell us to share us an anecdote or two about their experience and what <laughs> you think at the end of the visit? Definitely. Um, it's not uncommon when I connect with somebody, hi, I'm Dr. Horner, how can I be helpful to you today? First, can you hear me and see me? That's sort of my, my standard spiel. Um, and the first words out of their mouth are, I've never done this before. This is so cool. <laughs> you know, they sort of, um, or the patient that's on their phone and they're kind of bouncing around and you kind of have to tell them, okay, hold your phone steady. So, I can, <laughs> so, so now, you know, and kind of walk them through it. Um, I will say that the vast majority um, are super happy with how this goes because I think a lot of people, it's a little daunting to realize that you're, you're going to be connecting with somebody that you've never met that you know comes sort of vetted but by your health system or whichever but you've never met them and you don't know if they're going to be a nice doctor a mean doctor if they're going to be um a, you know medically appropriate and so i think a lot of patients are a relieved that they're getting a high quality of care um that they you know one of the benefits with telehealth is um we really try hard to take the time to explain some of the nuances, you know, uh, on um, some of the patient instructions, the follow up, um, and really help people understand that piece, um, just like we should be in any kind of urgent care uh, scenario, but to really help them also connect the dots. Here's when you need to go back and see your primary care provider, because we really always want to get people back to that. Um, but I think, you know, I've had, <laughs> I remember one scenario where, um, uh, there was an elderly family member walking. So the patient was seeing me from their couch and they actually had someone else in the room, you know, and, they, and I said, you realize that you're not alone. Are you okay with continuing with this visit? And uh, yeah, yeah, that's just grandma. So <laughs> as they disconnected, there was a little delay before the audio disconnected. And I heard, I heard the grandmother say, that was amazing. Who was that person? <laughs> So, so you get a fair number, a fair amount of that, where as people are disconnecting, they kind of turn to their family members, somebody off camera kind of gives their opinion on, on how much they really appreciate it. And especially right now during COVID, um, people are grateful to have healthcare, access to quality healthcare. And, um, and, and I think um, what we've heard from some of our clinicians that work with their own patients, and, and Ray, you can, I'm sure, speak to this better than I can, um, patients really appreciate being able to see doctors that they have an ongoing relationship with um, directly. And for some folks, the difficulty physically with getting into the office, some disabled patients, it makes a huge difference for them to be able to have this ability. 
Uh, we're going to take some questions and I'm going to ask you afterwards what, what do you think the future of telemedicine is going to be uh, post COVID or once post acute COVID. Uh, Sam Frank uh, asked uh, about licensing and then uh, asked a little bit about reimbursement and liability and how that uh, is influenced by telemedicine. And then if patients, Americans, are overseas and they're in France, can they see you uh, remotely? So I'm going to start with that one. That's the sort of easiest answer. The short answer is I'm not licensed in uh, France and so, or frankly, any international country. And our licensure is based on the location of the patient, which becomes really important to distinguish when we're doing telehealth because it's not, you know, obviously if you're in brick and mortar, they're in the same location as you. But um, when we're seeing patients on telehealth, it's not where is the pharmacy and the prescription going to, it's not where am I located, it's where is the patient located. And I need to be licensed in the state where they are physically located. Um, so we are really careful about um, making sure that we vet verify that. Um, that actually, patients don't always get that right. <laughs> so, um, so. And then um, the, uh, liability and reimbursement. So. Reimbursement, most um, health plans and uh, now are actually reimbursing for telehealth. It wasn't that way when, you know, AMO first started um, back in, um, you know, uh, really started picking up in 2012. Um, uh, but I would say most not only reimburse, they reimburse well for it. Um, uh, the um, uh, liability issue um, is was a much bigger issue. There was a lot of confusion around that back in the, um, you know, 2012, 2013 uh, kind of era. Um, when you look at the statistics now on liability in telehealth, actually doctors are sued less, and I can actually pull up the numbers uh, here. Doctors are sued less in telemedicine encounters than they are um, actually in brick and mortar. And that's not just a volume uh, issue. Um, there was a report that came out by the Physician Insurers Association of America um, that looked at over 94,000 claims between 2004 and 2013. So this is actually still back to 2013. Um, and of all of those claims, 94,000, only 196 claims were linked with telemedicine treatment. 56 resulted in some form of claim payment. The total indemnity loss for related uh, visits was 17 million compared to 8 billion for the total of all Medicare professional liability. So bottom line, liability issues are a fear that has not been really borne out in reality. Um, so if you had any malpractice suits against you that you're willing to talk about or um, I would be willing to talk about them, but I haven't had any. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I can and I can say let's knock on wood. Um, the Amwell Medical Group also has not had any since its founding. And I think Teladoc, when it went public, it disclosed in its uh, SEC filings that it hadn't had, I think, any tele any uh, live medical malpractice claims against yeah. against it. Um, you're a family practitioner. I think most of the AMWELL physicians are uh, internists, pediatricians. Uh, do you have specialists? Can you see a cardiologist? Can you see an endocrinologist? Can you see a dermatologist? So great question. Again, I'm going to distinguish between AMWELL Medical Group and what doctors can do on AMWELL. Because in AMWELL Medical Group, we, um, we are family physicians, internists, ER docs, um, and pediatricians. Um, we do have psychiatry. Um, so we have a behavioral health section where patients can see psychiatrists, they can see um, licensed clinical social workers, um, et cetera, for their behavioral health. And then we also have um, allied health professionals like nutritionists um, that patients can come online to see. Um, but from the medical specialties, um, it's more generalized within the AMWELL medical group. Now, there are a number of hospital systems that use our software and then the carts, the hardware, um, in order to empower their specialists to see care, but they are not doing so through the AMWELL Medical Group um, and through just sort of direct to consumer visits. Um, and so a uh, few specialists, although you have a few psychiatrists, uh, dietitians, uh, but for listeners who aren't familiar with AMWELL, I think the vast majority of visits over the AMWELL platform are with clinicians who aren't in part of the AMWELL group. They're Correct. community healthcare, they're part of, you know, Geisinger, they're part of Mayo Clinic or whoever else uh, AMWELL has partnered with uh, as a providing the pipes and the 
platform for which telemedicine visits could occur. I, at the University of Rochester, for example, could sign up to use the AMWEB platform and, and do visits that way. Um, I did tell you that we do have a lot of people who look at uh, telemedicine, not just from the clinical care point, but they also look at it from a, a research a, a question. Um, she has anything you want to tell us about uh, Amwell's uh, use in clinical trials for pharmaceutical firms? So um, Amwell has a number of different partners. We tend to prefer from a trial standpoint working um, you know, with health systems. We have worked, for example, with um, University of San Francisco, UCSF, um, and um, the um, and Apple for their Apple Heart study. I don't know uh, if if your listeners are familiar with that, but we were the uh, physicians that were on the front lines, basically helping to determine whether the Apple Watch actually uh, was a valid instrument in detecting atrial fibrillation. So yes, we actually do work with. Um, different different groups in order to do studies. We're a little careful, I'll be honest, um, doing pharmaceutical uh, research, um, primarily because we need to be super careful about um, ensuring that we are not promoting drugs. Um, we're pretty particular about um, making sure that while research is a really important uh, um, uh, uh, outreach, if you will, I'm struggling for the right word. Um, we, are, we are not p positioned typically to become the um, uh, prescribers for a particular proprietary medication. Um, so, and I know there are a lot of systems out there that do do that, um, but um, so. So uh, just, you mentioned the Apple Heart study, really a landmark study. Uh, this is uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, I think you guys can see this. Uh, over 400,000 people were enrolled in the study. All you had to do was have an Apple Watch and it uh, identified occult atrial fibrillation. A number of those individuals or occult tach tachycardias and those individuals were then referred to see an American Well doctor by a video visit and then sent uh, a, a device uh, to monitor their uh, heart rate more with by the gold standard. Um, if you want to learn more about it, uh, that's the study in the New England Journal of Medicine. It gives you a glimpse of what future clinical digital studies might look like. Uh, Giuseppe Urba asks, your sy sy system seems to be very efficient in terms of uh, multidisciplinary service providing accessibility. Could this be considered a model for a nationalized health system? Hmm. Great question. Um, I think, I think part of Part of the challenge is our system is efficient and it can link within different uh, electronic health records, but only to the extent that um, the health systems are actually willing to connect with one another. And I think, um, you know, the beauty of, uh, you know, on the one hand of a national health system, if you will, is ability to share records. Um, but right now, that is not something that is a foregone conclusion. So. Um, I think we need it, but we need it at, at a national level. If that's if that's going to be a priority, we need the ability to um, facilitate um, communication among the different systems. In terms of access, which is sort of typically the most um, prominent focus of a national health system, absolutely. One of the things that telehealth can do is um, reduce cost of delivery and and really help to stratify. Um, right care at the right time with the right clinician and um, making sure that that access is available um, without overburdening, um, you know, physical infrastructure. And we're seeing that in particular with COVID. Uh, one of the big uses for telehealth and the reason why so many health, uh, health departments and our, our government as well is really emphasizing telehealth is to really ensure that the patients that are seen um, can get care when they need it, where they need it, but without overburdening, say for example, your emergency departments. So I think, I think telehealth has an important role to play as in our future um, uh, with um, you know, efficient and quality healthcare delivery systems. Will it be the foundation of a national healthcare system? Um, that's a politics issue, um, and it kind of depends. <laughs> so there are some countries, Israel, for example, um, that has leveraged telehealth um, in its nationalized health system 
beautifully, uh, frankly, with American Well, and um, where primary care doctors actually have access to telehealth through, uh, uh, you know, this, through the same system, and um, it is integrated wonderfully. But again, they already had a nationalized health system. An easier question for when you don't have access to the patient's EMR, do you send the patient and the patient's clinician health, in this case, maybe your 14 year old pediatrician, a copy of your record? Yeah, great question. Um, we, we have the patient do that. We basically always send them a, a, a copy of the visit report and strongly encourage them to do that. Um, that, that way we make sure it gets into the hands of the clinician. We also make sure it gets into the hands of the pa patient and that they can actually bring it over. Where the systems are integrated, then that immediately goes straight into the patient record. Patrick Sawyer, just on that, how close are you to interoperability across EMRs for you? Um, we have that capacity. The question is whether or not the, the clients actually want to turn it on. So that's the hard part is not the technology. The hard part is the um, policy decision making, or the hard is the wrong word. But the, the key is going to be um, the individual clients uh, being willing and able to uh, turn that piece on. Uh, how did you learn to practice telehealth? What was the biggest hurdle and the also biggest benefit of practicing online? Yeah, great question. Um, and well trained me is the short answer. Um, and you learn a little bit as you go, some of the tips and tricks that work, but AMWELL has a really strong uh, value in training its clinicians how to do this and how to do a physical exam via telehealth. Because most of us come to it saying, you know, I'm so used to actually being able to lay my hands on a patient. How do I actually learn to use my eyes? So we train all of our clinicians before they get online. We train our health system clinicians, even if they're not ours, we, we offer them that training. Um, on how do you do this? Um, uh, so um, mostly it's it's upfront training, but then there's also the experience that comes fairly quickly of you know I want to see better. Hey, can you go over by the window? I actually can't. I don't really have good light. So so learning how to utilize natural resources within the patient's environment to get what you need. Uh, Ray, what was the second part of that question? Uh, what's the biggest hurdle and biggest benefit of practicing online? Mm. I think the biggest. Uh, the biggest hurdle is ensuring, in my opinion, that continuity of care and recognize, recognizing that we are placing the burden of responsibility. And this, this is true whether we're talking about telehealth or whether we're talking about brick and mortar urgent care practices. Um, you know, I come to medicine as a family physician who is a primary care provider from in my core. So being able to make sure that the patients that we see, whether it's in brick and mortar urgent care, in digital telehealth uh, urgent care, um, or whether it's in specialty uh, uh, telehealth, that, that, that they have a continuity of care among their, among their clinicians. And that is a system policy uh, issue, not a technology issue. Um, so, Real high level, big picture, biggest hurdle, I think, is making sure that those systems are integrated and that the coordination of care is integrated. Um, I think, and communication, honestly. Um, I think um, from a personal perspective, um, the, we have learned one of my concerns about potential, uh, potential issues with telehealth. Um, we've had sort of the, the the litmus test, if you will, in COVID, which is how scalable is it? And one of the things that we learned with COVID is um, with a lot of 24 seven round the clock work from our IT guys, it is actually scalable. Um, and you know those numbers that I told you earlier about a 2000% increase in our health system partners and a 200% increase in our AMWELL medical group docs, um, that's a big burden on the health, on the technologically technological infrastructure. And we've been able to keep it, um, which, and, and to keep up with it, which is, um, but that is, that is a caveat that I would say, we are not the only group out there and not everybody can keep up with it. Whether we're talking about healthcare, whether we're talking about other uh, digital needs like online education, uh, <laughs> I won't even go down that road. But um, so in terms of the best benefit, um, right care at the right time with the right clinician when patients want it. I cannot tell you how many patients I've seen, whether during COVID or after, prior to COVID, um, that are just so grateful to be able to, um, to access medical care for an issue that they know they need to be seen, but they don't have to go to a doctor's office and wait for an hour 
uh, to be seen, then have to, you know, it, it's a much longer process. So the convenience of care for patients means it lowers the bar for them actually getting seen. We see that also in behavioral health. And I'll, I'll stop there and just kind of leave that as a teaser because I know there are other questions, but uh, yeah. So you got to tell us uh, how long was the training and what was in the training, maybe in like 30 seconds or less. Yeah. Training um, basically was um, broken up into a number of different segments. Um, we offer it in pretty much every modality, both visual, written, um, uh, and experiential, where you get a test visit. So I would say total training is about, um, when you just look at the modules, it's about two hours, maybe three. Um, and um, sorry, second question. Uh, and then uh, what's the content of these two to three hours of training? Is it like seeing a visit? Is it, I don't know. How to use the technology, how to actually do medicine online. Like how can you look in somebody's throat um, and how to apply things like the Ottawa ankle rules in telehealth. Can you even do that? Yes, is the short answer, but how do you do that? How do you do a physical exam and reminding patient, reminding clinicians, if you will, um, uh, the statistic that you wrote earlier or that you quoted earlier about how much of a diagnosis is made from history, from physical, and what part of the physical can you still do via telehealth? And then also, who needs to be sent in? Two to three hours of a total of training. So it's not like 20 to 30 hours or two to three Oh, months. no, total. Um, now that said, we also have a whole bulk of clinical guidelines on if you're seeing somebody with this condition, here's some things. Remember, here's the evidence-based care. So we rely on our clinicians to actually brush up on that. Most docs know how to treat a sinus infection, but not everybody may. So we want to make sure that they have that access. <laughs> so... The last question for you, uh, you've seen widespread adoption of uh, telemedicine uh, in the setting of the COVID pandemic. What do you think happens as the pandemic hopefully uh, quiets down? Yeah. Or is telemedicine here to stay? Um, oh, telemedicine is definitely here to stay. I think, I think what we, we would eventually have gotten to the place where telehealth has been so heavily embraced and adopted across the country um, eventually. But I suspect that what COVID has done with the, you know, with the widespread self-isolation and quarantines is it has sped that process up um, by years. And um, I think being forced to experience uh, what telehealth can do has helped clinicians, patients, politicians, decision makers of, of all levels understand the power of telehealth. And that, that cat is not going back in the bag. Thank you very much for providing an inside look into uh, telemedicine in the setting of a pandemic. Cynthia, uh, join us for our next tech, next chat talk on Thursday, April 3rd at noon Eastern, when we'll be speaking with Andy Corbos. Andy's the co-founder and CEO of Electra Labs that captures biometric measures digitally. She's just one of the in industry's leading thinkers on virtual clinical trials and has published outstanding primers in the field. In the field. If you want to reimagine clinical trials together, uh, join us next week. Until then, the Center for Health and Technology at the University of Rochester, thanks you for joining us. Thanks, Ray. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Great stuff.